There may be some among you who are not familiar with the ins and outs of an Irish backstop. Even though the details are required reading in almost every fairy high school program besides the dwarves own, as their code of secrecy forbids the keeping of accurate records. Dwarf texts are littered with deliberate lies and exaggerations seated specifically to frustrate researchers. For example, dwarf bard Drollbag the Profound's history states that a dwarf's male belly is so stretchy it may uncomfortably accommodate the entirety of a bull troll. Which has proved false at least once a year when some gullible dwarf has tried it. Drollbag's book also claims that if a dwarf be rightly trundled, which translates to trapped in a tunnel, then he may spontaneously transform into 1. the most sparkly of rainbows, 2. a squirrel of the nimblest variety, or 3. a cloud of fetid gas. None of which are accurate, except the last one does have at least an element of truth to it. In spite of all this blarney, any dwarf who had ever chewed sod knows the story of the first Irish backstop as this tale has been passed down through the generations and is considered the holiest and most inspirational of histories. There are inevitably almost as many renderings of this story as there are dwarves to tell it, but the following condensed version has been woven together from common threads. It began in wartime, as these things often do. Back in the days before humans took up the reins as the planet's main organized force of evil, the dwarves were having a tiff with the elves. Their issue was as follows. The dwarves felt that the invasive root systems of weeping willow trees were collapsing their tunnels and in certain places needed to be culled. The elves felt that willow trees were sacred and must not under any circumstances be touched by fairy hands. One thing led to another, a branch chopped here, a limb sliced there, and within a century the dwarves and elves were at each other's throats and both camps had more or less forgotten the trees along the way. It all came to a head in Ireland when an elf troop charged into a dwarf pit and was trapped utterly. The dwarf general, a lover of cruel games, offered to walk back from the traditional extended torture of the elf and captain's staff if the captain himself would report to the elf king's tent and strike him dead. In exchange for this traitorous action, she would execute him and his troops without the usual torture. If he failed or reneged on his agreement, then there would be the usual torture, unless he himself returned to strike the killing blows. This was the Irish backstop, and was indeed a diabolical arrangement. The twice-cursed captain left the battlefield, but arrived back within the day, unable to complete his sworn mission. He had resigned himself to ending his own soldiers' lives with blasts from his magical lance rather than let them suffer. He aimed his lance, but the elf king, having heard of his captain's loyalty, showed up at the last second and surrendered to the dwarf general. The general's icy heart was melted by this gesture and she let the elves off the hook. There were hugs all around and fairies never fought again. Or so the story goes. The only part of that legend which Gavel Hortnut did not buy was the merciful ending. Take my word for it, human, she told Miles before prodding him from the basement room. Dwarf generals do not show mercy. I personally would have killed them all, including the elf king when he showed up. Cut off the head of the snake, then slice up the snake's body. Then burn the snake's segments. That's my philosophy. Miles felt for that snake, even if it was just metaphorical. Gundred was given the thankless task of delivering an expositional catch-up to Miles Fowl on their short journey to the surface. They were squashed side by side in a vehicle that was disguised to look like a discarded supermarket cart. It jerked forward in fits and starts while the nose rig pummeled and chewed the earth in front of it. The vehicle operated on a complicated hub of sealed gears and cogs ingeniously powered by Gundred's steady pedaling, a system that reminded Miles of Lazuli's backup flight mechanism. See LP file, the Fowl Twins. I imagine this is a short range vehicle, he said. Gundred grunted as she powered the craft through a rock shelf. That depends on the stamina of the pilot. A piglet can run forever with a robust operator at the pedals. A piglet, said Miles. Let me guess, propulsion through internal gears and locking epileptic transmission? It's loca not locking, said Gundred a touch grumpily. Locking is better, said Miles. You should take a note. 
Gundred pedaled a little more aggressively, but Miles either did not notice that he was needling the dwarf, or he did not care. Probably option B. Also, may I say, Gundred, this piglet of yours is not very aerodynamic. Gundred had an answer for that. We're not traveling through the air, human. I'm surprised you hadn't noticed. The principle's the same, said Miles. In fact, a subterranean craft should be more aerodynamic, if anything. Gundred was not taking notes on subterranean travel from a human. Forgive me if I don't pay too much attention to a mud boy on his first ride in a piglet. Oh, I do forgive that, said Miles, not sounding especially forgiving. What I shall not forgive is the incarceration, intimidation, and attempted murder. There will be a reckoning for those who can count on it. Gundred stopped pedaling, and the piglet shuddered to a halt in a layer of granite-speckled clay. Miles noted the buried skeleton of a horse frozen in mid-gallop, and wondered what calamity had befallen the animal. Listen, boy! The General's plan may seem wantonly cruel to you, but we have been hunting this treasure for decades. Once the heart is reclaimed, the heart nut seven may retire. My General will have restored the honor of her family. I know all about family honor, said Miles, and the price that family members must pay for it. Gundred resumed her labors, sending the piglet lurching forward. Uh, you wouldn't understand. You were born into a lo loving family. I've had no one until the general discovered me in the ruins of an acronym facility I demolished. I was half buried, half dead, and mute from shock and asphyxiation. Uh, Gavad might have let me to rot, but she nursed her life to drag me out and nurse me back to health. The first words I ever heard her say were, I could use a hero like you. Uh, now, twenty years later, I am the Hortnut number two. Miles lowered himself to a Beckettian joke. Yes, you're certainly number two, murdering pixels and children. That is perhaps not as I would wish it, but that is my general. Now and always. Miles disagreed. Not always, Gundred. Very soon she'll be a little no more. In fact, if you allow me to make a prediction, based on both my knowledge of your plans and my faith in my own abilities, I would say that Gvir Hortnut's days as a general will be over before the sun comes out tomorrow afternoon. And as he said this, Miles watched Gundred's face closely. The dwarf flinched, and the twin knew he was on the right track when her tone became suddenly aggressive. If I were you, I would be more concerned with what my comrade Axborn will do to your parents if this does not go how we wish it to go. For although you did not nominate them for your Irish backstop, your brother involved them by following you to our lair. My general has tasked Axborn to chew his way back to Donkey Island and contain the situation. Miles was concerned, but not panicked. Panicking was only of use when all intellectual routes had been exhausted. He would panic if the time came that there was nothing else to do. Gundred put all her energy into cycling for a long minute until the piglet broke through to open water. She cranked the digging rig around to the stern, where it operated as a propeller system, and for once, Miles was impressed. That explains the angle of the blades, he said. This is the first clever thing I've seen from you people. The piglet made lighter work of the new liquid element, and their speed picked up at a rate of knots. Miles watched as the clear tidal water was infiltrated by murky harbor sticks, and noted with some scientific interest a luminous weed he could not identify that seemed to be responding to the movement of fish rather than currents. Gundred stayed silent for several minutes, channeling her anger into the piglet controls that she operated with violent gusto, but eventually, she had to speak. You think you're so clever. By tomorrow afternoon, sunrise indeed. Miles raised a finger. Not sunrise. The sun will already be up relative to our position, that is. I'm at after the eclipse. The solar eclipse tomorrow. That's when you Hortnuts plan to make your big move. You're guessing, foul, snarled Gundred, pedaling as though she were repeatedly stomping on a certain human's head. I am deducing, corrected Miles. And if I may say so, it's an educated deduction. Hardly a deduction at all, really, considering the facts I have in my possession. 
Gundred steered around a tower of partially sunken shopping carts. My job was to bring you up to speed and give you your orders. Why don't you bring me? Why don't you let me bring myself up to speed and you drive the piglet? Said Miles. That way, both of us are playing to our strengths. Gundred was oh so tempted to jettison Miles there and then, but her general's order specified no killing humans until the part of the plan that required the killing of humans. So she did not seal off the passenger compartment and flood it. Instead, she imagined the steering wheel as Miles's throat and squeezed it to the wood cracked. Why don't you do that, Fowl? I'll just sit here and marvel at your genius. Finally, you're speaking sense, Mademoiselle Gundred, said Miles, sitting up to deliver his speech. <clears throat> I believe this entire misadventure was initiated last year when I hacked the Arcanum servers. The hot nut bound had probably insinuated a malware worm into their files, so when I downloaded them, I unwittingly took the worm too. Correct so far? Gundred decided to split hairs. We don't call it a worm, we call it a spider. I created it. A spider? said Miles. Oh, I see. You mean spider with a Y. How fun. To continue, I downloaded your spider, and now it's in my systems, keeping a close eye on my average keyboard stroke. You have no idea. We've been reading your secret journal for nearly a year. And during that year, I was mostly concentrated on the Akram sites, watching as the LEP shut them down one by one. Until... Until they set their sights on the penultimate facility in Florida. Which was special because... Gundred prompted. Because that's the most secure building in the world. It's inside an army base that's surrounded by a swamp and on an island for heaven's sake. Impenetrable, said Gundred, who thought she was a green. Miles corrected her yet again, which he enjoyed. No, it's penetrable, but the penetrators would never escape. A one-way trip, as it were. The entire facility was rigged to sink rather than expose acronym's secrets. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea indeed if you're an acronym director, agreed Miles. But General Hartnett did not wish this particular site to sink, because then it would be difficult to control the scene. And she needed to control the scene in order to extract Akronim's treasure. Our treasure! snapped Gundred. The remaining ingots of the Hortnet Horde. Akronim has been using it for hundreds of years to fund their operations against the people. It's sacrilege that our own gold is used against us. Soon it will be returned to its rightful home. Miles tapped his teeth. In Gvild's mouth! Gundred bristled. Her grill was made from recovered Akronim gold. My general wears it as a reminder of our mission. She really shouldn't, noted Miles. Akronim tagged its gold with radiation. It's in the files. Gundred released a water cam from the piglet's roof panel. It floated to the surface and broadcast a live feed to the craft's left porthole. Miles immediately recognized the industrial end of Dublin's Docklands with its unusual mixtures of cruisers and cargo ships tied on the far shore. The general's math is the general's business said Gundred, as they passed below the East Link Bridge. Tell me what you know of our plan if you wish to see your brother ever again. The General's plan was both elementary and ingenious, which the best plans often are, said Miles. Gvir uses her missile over Florida to trigger Acronym's contingency plan, which was to move the treasure to their backup facility in Dublin, if Florida ever came under attack. I'd imagine you always tried to raid this facility and failed, so now you need me to try again. We tried from underground, but we're thwarted, said Gundred. Now we must try from the surface. Miles nodded. And I have no doubt you will use your previous position to fake a small earthquake. Gundred grunted in affirmation. There was no harm in confirming the boy's theories. In fact, he needed all available information if he were to succeed in his mission. We evacuated after the last attempt, she said. But we left ourselves a way back in. Vigor and the two warriors your brother somehow incapacitated will take their positions in a sub-basement. Those two are most eager to make up for their shortcomings. The ideal time to mount the assault will be tomorrow during the solar eclipse, noted Miles. When most of the city will be distracted and extremely false attentive dwarves will not be in any danger from the sun's rays. Before the sun comes out tomorrow afternoon... 
Miles tapped his chin. But the big question is, why'd you need me? That's what I keep asking myself, said Gundred, steering the piglet starboard toward the Samuel Beckett Bridge. I understand why you tried to kill us, said Miles without emotion. You realize that I was studying the Florida site and planning a reconnaissance flyover. It was perfect. All you had to do was strap Lazuli to a missile you had already planned to fire, and the wreckage would reveal both foul and fairy corpses. Akram will lose their minds, think the facility was both compromised and under international scrutiny. And the LEP would quite reasonably believe that we foul boys had turned specialist heights to our side, and all this was some kind of botched foul scheme. In the end, the Hortnut Band would get rid of their competition. But your plan to murder us failed, so you had to snatch me from the island instead. And replace you with a clone to fool your parents, said Gundred, eager to provide the foul boy with information he might be unaware of. I'd imagine it's a copy rather than a clone, said Miles. Clones take a long time to grow. A copy can be printed up in a day. As Miles casually displayed his brain power, Gundred began to realize why they did in fact need the boy. And the only possible reason for the switch would be that there is an unforeseen problem that only I can help you with. Gundred nudged the piglet into a cavity in the quay wall under the bridge and turned yet another crank, ratcheting out two stability clamps to hold the craft in place. I don't suppose you want to tell me what our problem is, Miles Fowl? If you like, said Miles. It's urgent, of course, if you are to stick to your new Eclipse timetable. Since you apparently need a human to solve this problem, it must involve interaction with humans. If you need me in particular, then it's by nature a problem of the intellect, as Beckett would be the better choice for physical or dexterous work of any kind. And since we find ourselves moored here beside the Convention Center Dublin, which is indeed a convention center, but also the top two floors are the Akram Field Office, that now houses the famous Hortnut Horde, I deduce that the problem is here and is most likely an issue of access. How am I doing, number two? Not bad, admitted Gundred. In conclusion, I would say that the only mystery here is why you have made me wait until now to reveal the specifics of your access issue, as my not inconsiderable brain could have been working on the problem since we left the lair. It's almost as if you don't want me to succeed. Almost, agreed Gundred. Then she mirrored a video from her communicator onto the porthole screen. But I'd prefer that you do. Ah, said Miles when the video was over. I just see. That is a problem. Gavild and her band had been surveying Dublin's convention center for months, ever since Akronim had realized, as had Miles, that their facilities were being shut down by mysterious raids or natural-looking disasters. The shadowy intergovernmental organization had also realized that it was only a matter of time before Florida came under attack too, and when that happened, they would need a fallback base of operations. Florida had been the last stand, secure as it was, but whoever was infiltrating the isolated and fortified facilities seemed to relish the isolation and somehow glide through fortifications like they weren't even there. It made sense to the powers that be, at acronym, that the whoever in question was probably the magical group they had been hunting for centuries, i.e. fairies. Of course, fairies would prefer to operate in isolated spots, and naturally, their superior technology rendered any human defenses useless. So some months previously, Akronim had gone down a different route and chosen as their fallback site the Convention Center Dublin. They hung on to their defenses, but chose a site in the middle of the city where people were encouraged to congregate on the lower floors so there would be no seeking in for fairies. This was not the problem, because... 1. The Reclaimers were used to blending in with humans. And 2. They didn't need to go any farther than the elevators anyway. The problem was that someone at the fairy hunting agency must have recognized that the fairy folk knew every play in the acronym book. So this person had gone off book and old school. Up until the previous week, the open plan lower floors had been leased to a thriving 24-7 e-storage solution company by the name of Flash, which guaranteed constant activity in the center. Now though, the company had completely vanished, leaving nothing behind but their oversized red Flash signage. So instead of weaving their way through the crowded shop floor, any disguised dwarf would have to cross an open atrium under the watchful eyes of a highly visible security detail on the middle balcony and possibly a highly invisible detail somewhere else. When did this happen? Miles asked. 
Uh, we're not certain, said Gundred. Recently, they just kicked them out, which messes with our plan B. They know we're coming, and maybe the boss here decided to ignore the main office and get rid of distractions. And your original plan cannot be salvaged. No, said Gundred. Acronym didn't send in the gold by truck as we thought they would. They helicoptered in from the airport. Our guys were sitting downstairs like dummies while the humans tucked the gold away in the safe. I see, but surely you have another strategy. Of course we do! In the event of a seismic occurrence, the treasure is shunted automatically to the executive elevator. That elevator is built to withstand the entire building collapsing. So what do you need for me? I need you to get Gavelled and me into that central elevator. And then what? Then we fake a small earthquake and the gold is transferred to the elevator. You wanted an Irish backstop? This is your Irish backstop. Get us into that elevator during the eclipse. You have one hour to come up with a plan. After that, the torturing begins. And just to be clear, you die last. Miles spoke without thinking, which was unlike him. If I were you, I'd kill me first, because in all modesty, I am the most dangerous of your opponents. Gundred nodded slowly, taking this advice to heart at least. You know something, human? I just might see what I can do about that. Truth be told, Miles had already put together a plan for what he would should do, Acronym decides to switch up on their procedures. Miles prided himself on plotting for all eventualities, not just plan A and plan B, and in this situation he had calculated that there were 6 probable bear variations in procedure and 30 improbable ones. Most clandestine agencies remained in the shadows by being unpredictable, and Acronym was more shadowy than most. But what had happened here was straight out of the middle management mutiny handbook. The regional boss must have completely freaked out when major responsibility came his way and decided to ignore orders from Florida. He was the ranking officer on the ground in Dublin, and he was going to run security the way he saw fit. And he saw fit to double the guard and land the gold on the roof. Middle management mutiny was number 5 on Miles' list, and landing the gold on the roof was number 6. So, the situation here was a combination of 5 and 6 without an improbable variation 14, which was, boot out the tenants. The solution to this was highly unusual, but also already in place, and it only took Miles a couple of minutes to set it in motion on the Piglet smart screen. He pointed a finger at the screen. Look, Mademoiselle Gundred, he said. All done! Gundred took her time reading. So this will happen before the eclipse? An hour before, confirmed Miles. It's all right there. It's all right there in theory. Are you sure these people answer the call? Miles was sure. I am aware that human reaction seems like a variable in this equation, but trust me, it's a constant. It happens every day. More and more, in fact. Miles resisted the urge to lecture his captor, as he had no desire to antagonize her any further, especially with Beck and Lazuli in mortal danger but it seemed to him that Gundred was taking an age to read through the plan that was already in motion. We could be on the way back to that basement in Dalky, he thought. We didn't need to waste time coming out here in the first place. Miles tried to distract himself by looking around. He had never seen Dublin's port from this vantage, and was surprised by how many access steps there were from the seawall to the dockside above. From the ages of barges, he supposed. He also noticed how few of the pedestrians who hurried past, seemingly conversing with thin air, actually looked down at the water. Too busy on their ear pods, he realized. And if people had glanced downward, all they would have seen was yet another discarded shopping cart that had been tossed into the river. And there is very little danger of anyone actually fishing it out. After several minutes of Gundry checking through his plan, Miles let out a mildly irritated groan, which prompted her to ask, Am I keeping you, mud boy? Do you have somewhere to be? Before Miles could answer, Gundred thrust her communicator into his hand. Here, take this. There's a call for you. Miles instinctively knew where this call was coming from, and he steeled himself for what he was about to see. Stay in control, Dr. Fowl, he told himself. Emotion is the enemy of intellect. Miles looked at the screen and saw his parents in Villa Echo's safe room. They were not holding a communicator, which meant that someone was pointing a camera at them. That someone was Axborn, Miles guessed, the dwarf with the funny bow beard. 
Miles, said his mother. Are you all right? Is Beckett safe? We are both fine, mother, said Miles. Have you been hurt? It was his father who answered in a brusque tone. No, son, just our pride. This is really intolerable, Miles. What happened to the fairy ban? You didn't even make it back to the villa before you broke your promise. And we had to watch that copy of you dissolve before our eyes. That is correct, father mine, said Miles. It was a copy. Of course it was a copy, said Miles Artemis Sr. The organs were made of paper, mostly. I do apologize for all this palaver, said Miles. Believe me when I say that it is not my doing, and I will extricate the family from this predicament. And lovely Lazuli too, said his mother. Yes, of course, Lazuli too. Miles thought of the pixel wrapped in a vine suit and determined he should get back to the pressing issue of saving lives. He had just enough time to deliver one vital message. All you need to do is stay cool, he told his parents. Artemis Sr. was surprised to hear these words coming out of his son's mouth. I'm sorry, Miles, my boy. Did you, did my son Miles just tell his parents to stay cool? I did, said Miles. Just stay cool until I come to let you out of the safe room. Stay cool. It's an informal phrase meaning to relax or avoid becoming agitated. We know what it means, Miles, said Artemis Sr. It just seems strange coming from you. Gudrid had apparently finished reading the plan because she snatched the communicator out of Miles' hand. And that's enough of that, human. I just wanted you to see how thoroughly you are outmaneuvered. Whatever you try, somebody close to you will die. Miles thought this was probably true, but he had to try anyway. Or else, he was reasonably certain, everybody would die. Half an hour later, Miles was being bundled out of the piglet back into the Dolky basement where Beckett and Lazuli were being held captive. General Gavild Hortonut was sitting on a crate in the light of Beckett's spitball, delivering a mini pre-battle pep talk to Vigor and two slightly shamefaced dwarves. They can take our land, she told her audience of three, but they will never take our gold. Miles, who was transfixed by the sight of his twin revolving in the glowing ball, ran his mouth automatically. Technically, they did take your gold. We are merely taking it back. Gvild froze, her fist raised, and swiveled her eyes in order to subject Miles to her familiar glare. Not that such a distinction is important, said Miles hurriedly. Don't mind me, I'm just a sickler for the details. Most irritating, I realize. Gvild continued her speech. They said that on that fateful first night ten thousand years ago, when the humans collapsed our warrens and stole our hard mined gold, there was a foul among the humans. You heard that right. A mighty foul warrior was amongst the first to claim his share of our treasure. This one's no warrior, said one listener, who had a rune shaved into a scalp and an obviously dyed orange beard tied at the back of his neck and running over his shoulders like a cloak. Nor his brother neither. Gavil did not point out that Miles' brother certainly had behaved like a warrior. Yes, Dagai, she said. These mudspawn are not warriors, but they have talents nonetheless. And they will try to destroy us as their kind have done for thousands of years. But let me promise you something. Not this time. This time the Hortnut Reclaimer shall be victorious. This time the humans lose. This time the humans lose, echoed Digar, brandishing what Miles recognized from his schematic files as a lance version of an LEP buzzbaton. About that, said Miles. I have delivered on your Irish backstop. You can walk into that elevator and claim the Hortonut gold. Gavell nodded slowly. Gundred sent me the file and read it carefully. I have to say, boy, that technically you did not deliver anything. Not the way I interpret it. Miles returned her slow nod. I see. Because my plan has not yet borne fruit, you are choosing to categorize it as a failure. That I am, said Gavild, and that is why Daigar volunteered to stay behind and make sure the terms of failure are met. You don't have a problem with that, do you, Daigar? No, my general, I can be relied upon. Dwarf law says the terms must be met. 
Miles appealed to Gundred. And you, mademoiselle, does it seem like it is in accordance with dwarf law to you? Gundred could not meet his eyes. Gavard, my general, the human delivered. His plan is sound. Yes, number two, said Gavard, resting a hand on Gundred's shoulder. The, his plan. But I don't trust human plans that seem solid, but will melt like ice in the sun. A possible future result is of no use to me. I do not wish my last thought under this earth to be, the human betrayed us and I let him live. But they are children, said Gundred, with an edge of protest in her voice. No, said Gavald. They are fowls. Believing the fowls to be harmless children has historically been a deadly mistake for our kind. Foul spawn are born dangerous. Even Miles couldn't argue with that, and neither did Gundred. Of course, my general. As always, you show us the way. Gavelle smiled her dazzling golden smile. I try, my friend, she said. Now is everything unfolding as planned. Yes, General, said Gundred. Vigor and the shame will make their way to the basement with their charges, and I have chosen some appropriate disguises for the two of us. Very good, number two, said Gavelle. Fetch the outfits and I shall meet you at the piglet. Gundred bowed slightly. Yes, General. And she left, keeping her gaze glued to the floor, making zero eye contact with Miles. Gavel nodded at Digar. Is your lance charged? Digar pressed a button on the shaft and electricity fizzled at the tip. Course, General, I will not fail you. I never doubted you, soldier, said Gavel, clapping him on the shoulder. Remember, once the clever one kills the stupid one, he must shoot the pixel before earning his own quick death. Those are the terms. This was said as though the general were reading from an everyday to-do list of chores. Digar counted off on his fingers. Stupid one, pixel, clever one, got it. Good soldier, said Gavald. And then once she had checked to make sure Gundred had indeed left the donkey basement, the general whispered in Miles' ear. Sometimes Gundred wavers. She is not a born Hortnut, after all, but she is an invaluable sounding board for me and my dearest friend under the earth. But this mission is different. It's the last mission, and what Gundred doesn't need to know is... You're going to kill every Akronom agent in that building, finished Miles. Shut them down for good. Miles could not believe he had not seen this before. Perhaps it was simply too horrible an option for his mind even to consider. You're not going to simply fake a seismic event. You're going to blow up that building and destroy any evidence that you were ever there. Gvelt smiled. Maybe you're more like me than you thought. Miles did not respond. He was thinking how he himself had ensured that thousands of extra humans would be caught up in Gvelt's explosion. Feel guilty later, he ordered himself. Solve the current problem first. The current problem was Digar the one who was so eager to kill some humans. Gavelle curled the fingers of her right hand into a cylinder and peered through them at her soldier. Tunnel safely, my soldier, and do not talk to that human lest he worm his way into your head. Digar returned the gesture. Tunnel safely, my general. And then the general was gone, and Digar took a human handgun from his belt.